This week on Motor Week, it's a life of luxury and extreme contradictions. Ken Gibson gets an exclusive drive in the Vauxhall VX220, an ultra-light, nimble competitor for the Lotus Elise, built for Vauxhall, well, by Lotus. And then to more mundane matters, but probably more important in day-to-day -day life, I get a drive of the Nissan Tino. It's a competitor for the Renault Scenic, built by a company now owned, well, by Renault. And then whilst I relax in the sumptuous comfort of one of the biggest luxury cars on the market, Ginny Buckley gets to check out a smaller luxury offering. Nevertheless, it is from a luxury brand. It's the newly V6 engine Mercedes SLK. The new Mercedes SLK had sat outside my house for the best part of a day and I couldn't bring myself to drive it. It wasn't that I was in awe of its power or had doubts that I could handle it. It was just that every time I went to get into it, it felt like I was crashing a royal garden party. You see, for most of my time, I dress like a boy. Down the pub, you can definitely make mine a pint, and I'm afraid I don't own anything that remotely resembles a handbag, and that's my problem, because to drive a car like the SLK, you need to be a lady, and the very thought of getting into it makes me feel like Eliza Doolittle, only not quite as posh. And the SLK is certainly a posh car. More than any other luxury brand, Mercedes has that certain something. A Mercedes oozes class and wealth. Just look at the SLK's sleek, sculptured lines and the incredible roof that folds away in one sweeping movement at the flick of a switch. Now, this may be a new model, but only the new door mirrors that house the indicators really give the game away. After all, what is it they say? If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it's that badge that's finally encouraged me to overcome my intimidation and use the key. You see, the 320 badge means that this car is Mercedes' stunning V6 version. This new engine has a top speed of 152 miles an hour. It can power you to 60 in just under seven seconds, and it pumps out up to 218 brake horsepower, which kicks in at just over 5,500 revs and feels fantastic. When you first take to the road in the SLK, it feels like quite a difficult car to drive. The clutch is quite vicious and the gearbox feels notchy. But it doesn't take long to get used to it, and then you realise that it's actually fantastic fun behind the wheel. It handles beautifully. It's a very well-balanced car and it's got bags of grip. What Mercedes have been able to do is combine the real feeling of luxury and wealth that you get in this car with something that's very sporty and does feel fantastic fun. And that's quite a difficult thing to do and they've really cracked it. Oh yes, when you do get your foot down and let rip, this engine really sings. Not in a ladylike, tuneful way. It feels more like a rock chick blasting along and letting you have a bit of fun. And if it's fun that you're after, then this six-speed manual gearbox is definitely the one to go for. The previous version of the SLK was only available with a five-speed automatic transmission, which is still available in this version, but it just isn't as much fun. It's OK if you just want to, you know, cruise around town taking it easy, but you really need this manual gearbox to get the most out of this very sporty car and really appreciate what it's all about. This snappy six-speed gearbox really does feel the part and it makes driving the SLK far more enjoyable. As I said, it does feel a bit notchy, but you do quickly get used to snapping it into gear and it helps you make the most of the SLK's superb engine. Well, my experience in the SLK hasn't quite been as scary as I thought. In fact, if I'm being honest, I think I could quite get used to it. But before I take it out for a spin again, I'm off to change into a twin set and pearls. I'm going to find a dainty little handbag, and who knows, I may even give drinking pims a try. The MPVs, they're great, they're definitely the way forwards. They take up no more space on the road than your average family hatch, but they've got all the practicality and flexibility of that one-box format. The only problem is they're about as interesting to look at as a test card. Let me prove it. <laughs> 
see what I mean? Which would you rather look at? This or this? It's 50-50, isn't it, really? But we're going to see an awful lot more Mini MPVs on the road. Experts predict that over its first 10 years, that particular segment of the market will triple the number of sales, if not more. This is the latest to join them. There's only four or so on the market now. This new one is the Nissan Almira Tino. It succeeds in slipping by pretty much unnoticed when it comes to the drive as well, by virtue of being really quite impressively neutral. There's very little of the usual rock and roll you'd get from most of the other mini MPVs. It corners very flat and level. That's because it has the same rather clever suspension you find on the Almira. There's not a huge amount of power. You can have a 1.8 petrol, a 2 litre petrol, or a 2.3 direct injection diesel. They're all quite strong engines, but nothing most to write home about. Nissan, of course, now very much under the control of Renault. And if you're looking at the Tino and thinking, there's something rather Renault scenic-ish about that, don't bother, because this car was well and truly underway years before they decided to get together. It's based on the Almira platform, a car much loved by the elderly driver who can no longer stand the frantic pace of their heyday in their Micra. It follows the usual pattern. Take your hatchback car, take the body off, put a single volume body on top of it, give it MPV characteristics, but all in miniature, and off you go, one practical car. Nissan say that they've styled the interior after digital cameras, interestingly enough. By that they mean all the little silver knobs and buttons and the kind of clean, quite sharp lines. Which is interesting because Nissans are the favourite transport of the incredibly aged and infirm. They're hoping at Nissan to get a much younger audience for this. Obviously, they're after the kind of dynamic young family type, 35, two kids, you know, the sort of thing. I'm not saying it looks unpleasant, because I don't think it does. There's some nice lines on it, and it does have a certain almost aggressive stance from some angles. It's just not desperately interesting. Oh, put the test card up. The interior, though, is actually quite decent. They've put a bit of thought into it. It certainly looks different from the usual hatch. And interestingly, they've shunned the usual, put the seat about six inches higher than usual so you feel in command. They've actually put it slightly lower, so it's not much higher than an ordinary hatchback. The result is you don't feel like you're driving a big vehicle. You do feel you're in something quite compact. It all works very well in here. It's just very interesting, but then it's not supposed to be. The idea is that you use the car to do lots of interesting things with your crazy family life. But the result is, well, you're better off with the test card. Look. There's nothing wrong with plagiarism. In fact, I'm all for it. If manufacturers nick one another's best ideas, the result is going to be better cars. But you do need to add something else to make your car unique. And this, I'm not sure that it's got that. All the other Mini MPVs have. There's the Zafira from Vauxhall. It's the only one with seven seats. The Fiat Multipla looks like nothing else on Earth. Citroen's Picasso. You can have a full-length sunroof. And at least Renault with the scene, it can still just about claim to be the first. But this, what does it do that the others don't? Probably the only thing that it will do is be built in Japan. It shouldn't break down. It should last. And the build quality is undeniably very good. Both good features, but hardly interesting. So I guess for you and me, we're best off getting back to the test card. Nah, don't like the colour, don't like the colour, don't like the uh, big gold Bentley badge. Still, if a car that's as big as a house and costs twice as much isn't what does it for you, then we get ultra lightweight and fast after the break with Ken Gibson in the ultra fast Vauxhall VX220. Now, what else they got round here? Now here's a little giveaway to help you. Recognise the badge? Yes, it's a Vauxhall. Now it wouldn't surprise me if you were totally amazed at that because this is not your average sensible family Vauxhall. This is the boys from Vauxhall gone mad with the VX220 sports car. 
It's absolutely stunning looking, but of course it was designed with one thing in mind, driving. Handling is superb, the steering is razor sharp, and the ride, although hard, isn't bad either. A sort of no compromise compromise. The 2.2 litre engine delivers 0 to 60 in just 5.6 seconds, a top speed of 136, and it's surprisingly economical. It's capable of 34.4 miles per hour if you drive sensibly, but you definitely don't want to do that. It's a truly British sports car, designed by a Brit, Martin Smith, and built at Lotus's Norfolk factory. The pricing is an ultra-competitive 22,995, but the really bad news is Vauxhall are only going to build a thousand right-hand drives a year, and that's almost criminal. Understandably for a sports car, luggage space is not a strong point. But the rear boot is actually more than adequate for two soft overnight bags. Despite the VX's deliberately spartan cabin, there's some neat design touches and clever use of bare aluminium, including a starter button and traditional wind-up windows. I am, however, in a bit of trouble with a man from Vauxhall. I've missed the flight, and now he says I've got to drive this little car all the way back to England. Sometimes this is a very hard job, but somebody's got to do it. Here's a good one, right? You'll love this. What do you get if you cross a sheep with a kangaroo? Well, probably quite an expensive lawsuit, and you certainly open up an interesting moral debate, but we do love our hybrids. It's the same with everything. We won't settle for just a food processor. It's got to double up as a letter opener and shower cap as well. And the same goes for our cars. We want that bit extra. That's why Audi invented the A6 Avant, and a state car crossed with a sports car. Now they've done it again with this, the all-road, and a state car crossed with a sports car crossed with an off-roader. The result? Surely a big wobbly bag of compromises. But we'll find out. Drive the petrol engine version in a bit of a hurry and you'll start to see what you would dream of in an ordinary off-roader. 0-60 comes up in a shade under 8 seconds, a top speed 147 miles an hour, and all with that sure-footed, almost sports car handling. Start to drift off-road and we're rocking and rolling. It copes extremely well. Because we're not a huge, cumbersome off-roader, it can actually skip along the smaller bumps very well indeed. Audi's interiors can hold their head up in any company. I rate them as amongst the very best in the world. So it's good news that there's no disappointment in here. It's every bit an A6 Avant. Beautiful, clean, sharp lines everywhere. And every single bit made of the best quality materials and fitted beautifully. There's no stray lines or big gaps. There's all the usual kit you'd expect to find on board. We've got sophisticated satellite navigation, electrical everything, including my seat. But we've also got one interesting little panel here, and it's a big giveaway that this is actually a pretty serious car. It's down here. Because when Audi named it the All Road, they did so with good reason. It's suitable for all roads, and that's not just because it has the Quattro four-wheel drive system. It also has a very clever air suspension system, which allows it to vary the ride height according to the conditions. Let me explain and demonstrate. Right now, we're at normal. About there, for ordinary day-to-day -day driving around town. If you go over 75 miles an hour or press the button to lower it, it automatically drops to its lower position, streamlined for going really fast. If you want to go a bit off-road, you hit the button, you go up past normal and onto high one. We've got a bit of extra ground clearance, so we don't catch anything underneath, fine. If it gets really tough, we can hit the button again 
and we go up to high too. We're really high up. Nothing can catch us and we're safe. That's the theory. That's just me jumping up and down. Don't know how it works in the car. So we'll try it and we'll try it on all roads. It is surprising. With this system, you can get an Audi into places that you really don't expect to see an Audi. And more importantly, you can get it out again. Driving as I was, the automatic is certainly not ideal for off-roading. This one doesn't have the optional low-ratio gearbox either, so going downhill, I had to put the brakes on, which can mean locking an occasional wheel. It does get a bit alarming, but we certainly got ran unscathed. Mind you, part of me was wondering, would I really want to take an estate car that costs between 32 and 36,000 pounds off-road at all, where the body could get all dinged and scratched? Mind you, if you've got the money to pay for the car, you'd probably have the money to have all the blemishes taken out. So, does this most compromised of cars actually work? Well, it does manage to take all the best bits of the three cars that go to make it up, and none of the worst. It does have decent off-road ability without being as big as your house and thirsty than you'd ever want to pay for. It's certainly got practical estate car capabilities, but it doesn't look boring and bland. It looks great, in fact. And yes, it's certainly a sports car, but it's not as small and pokey as most ordinary sports cars. So, yes, it does work. Right, I've got to go and collect my new combined hat stand, toothbrush and roller skate, so I'll be off. Hey. First launched almost 20 years ago, the Mitsubishi Shogun rapidly established itself as one of the world's toughest and best-selling 4x4s. Well, now they're launching the third generation of the Shogun, and it encompasses some of the most revolutionary changes in the Shogun saga so far. Why revolutionary? Well, for a start, they've thrown away the chassis. Now, in the past, big 4x4s were traditionally based on engineering that resembled the fourth bridge, two huge girders that comprised the chassis. Wheels, axles, gearbox, engine and suspension were attached to the underneath of the chassis and the body was plonked on top. Well, now they've thrown away the whole of that ironmongery and they've built the car as a monocoque, just like a saloon car. Does that mean Shogun's gone soft? Let's find out. Now, well aware that that's the question every journalist will want answering, Mitsubishi have laid on a tough cross-country course here at the launch site near Barcelona in northern Spain. Shogun gets new suspension and a new independent back end replaces the old model's solid back axle. This gives better on-road ride and handling, but it doesn't compromise off-road ability either. Certainly, it's very comfortable over the rough stuff. And it seems to have just as much grip and ground clearance as the old car. I'm not sure how long these plastic skirts will last, though, if you go seriously off-road. Very steep slopes, admittedly, but it's very dry, and uh, the Shogun has absolutely no difficulty coping with the track they've laid out for us. How good it would be towing a horse box out of a muddy field or a substantial boat up a slimy slipway remains to be seen. Of course, the whole image of 4x4s has changed fundamentally since the days the farmers would put the pigs in the back of the Land Rover to take them to market. Today, very few of these vehicles go seriously off-road, and even fewer of them work hard for their living. As a result, the luxury side of 4x4 has become more and more important to the marketeers. Hence, this is kitted out, as you'd expect, with wood and leather and all the knobs and whistles, air conditioning, cruise control, slick new automatic gearbox and uh, sophisticated hi-fi. Trouble was, in the past, you could have this veneer of sophistication, but the thing still handled on the road like a bit of a truck. So now, Shogun is following the lead set by Land Cruiser and New Discovery to try and give the car 
most limousine standards of ride and handling on the road. Largely they've succeeded, certainly so far as noise suppression, comfort and ride quality is uh, concerned. However, roll always used to be a bugbear of big 4x4s and although it's far better controlled in this car than the old one, it still wallows around a bit on fast corners. Two new engines in the car, a 30 miles to the gallon 3.2 litre direct injection diesel, develops 162 brake horsepower and a bumping 275 pounds feet of torque at just 2,000 RPM. And that's great for lugging horse trailers out of muddy fields. There's a 21 miles to the gallon, three and a half litre V6 petrol engine that develops 200 brake horsepower and in the short wheelbase version makes it a bit of a road rocket, 115 miles an hour flat out. So that's the new Shogun and it certainly is all new. Manufacturers sometimes fight shy of radical new designs, preferring to carry over the identity of the previous model. Look at new discovery, for example. Mitsubishi have taken a bold step with this car and the market will show whether they're right or not. Prices when it launches, well, £25,000 for the entry level, right up to £38,000 for the top of the line car. It's not cheap and it certainly ain't a farmer's workhorse anymore. And that's not the end of our little flirtation with the theme of contradiction and luxury because next week on Motorweek I'll be test driving the new Mercedes S-Class, one of the ultimate luxury cars, but this time powered by diesel.